We're going to be looking at James chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, picking up where we left off last week. Uh, we observed one of the ordinances here of the church in Lord's Supper in two weeks' time. On November 10th, we'll be observing the other with baptism, as we'll be uh, filling the baptistry for the baptism of Stephen Rose. We had the privilege of a church of uh, witnessing his older brother Ian's baptism last year. Um, if you have feel that God has been laying it upon your part, uh, upon your heart to uh, respond to the gospel in faith and repentance, and would like to seek biblical baptism by immersion, I encourage you. Uh, to make an appointment with me this week. I'd be glad to sit down and talk to you about that and see if that is right and fitting given your circumstance and where you are in the faith. Uh, we're going to start off today by faith we do good work. Sometimes uh, we get this all confused and we had this whole Protestant Reformation about this thing and, and we think that those two things don't go in the same sentence together, faith and works. What we were protesting in the Protestant Reformation was the idea that works brought about faith, or works saved us. No, faith saves us. That's what the whole Protestant Reformation was about. And uh, this is uh, coming up on the 502nd anniversary of the, what is traditionally marked as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. That was October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther went and nailed his 95 accusations against the Roman Catholic Church and its system of works upon the Wittenberg Chapel door there in Germany, sparking uh, the Protestant Reformation. But today we're going to get these two. It's, it's easy to see in Scripture how some might get this mistaken, but I think with a little bit of effort and elbow grease we can see what picture is painted here that faith precedes good fruit. Okay, that's what we're going to paint here. Uh, we're going to start off with James chapter 1, verse 22, something we looked at a couple weeks ago. Uh, it says, But prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves or deceive themselves. Again, I'm going to argue that this is pretty much the main point. This is the central theme of the book of James. James is appealing to his audience to hear the word of God and internalize it, not just give it an intellectual stamp of approval, okay? He wants his hearers, he wants you and he wants me uh, to really think upon and meditate and contemplate the deeper things of scriptures. He wants us to see the beautiful one that scripture is pointing straight at, that is Jesus Christ. And it, and, and it says to us, he, he's saying to us, surrender to him, submit to him. Take off your old self and put on your new self in Christ Jesus, placing your faith wholly in him to the point that it changes, it changes you. It changes you fundamentally in both thought and word and deed. That is action. This is what it means to be a doer of the word and not just a, a mere hearer. Last week, James gave us a test to examine ourselves by to see if we were an effectual doer and not a forgetful hearer. Okay, the test was that of partiality based on superficial, worldly, fleshly criteria. This week, he gives us another test. This week, it is how we respond to a brother or sister in need. You will see that James uses some wording that can cause the incautious reader some consternation as he appears to challenge the orthodox doctrine of sola fide, or faith alone, salvation by faith alone. I will show you that, in fact, he does not contradict or challenge what we see Paul so readily putting forth in his epistles, but rather James is just building upon what Jesus taught and what Paul, the great apostle, taught, which is re that real saving faith will be changing faith. Okay, it has to be. That, that will eventually give evidence of itself through good works or what Jesus called fruit. It's going to make itself apparent so as we normally do, let's read the passage in its entirety, and then we're going to back up and break it down a little bit. 
So uh, look along with me, if you would, in James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. He asks this question. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. You can see there, verse 24, he says there, uh, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. You can see how that could be kind of a controversial verse in Scripture. It is one of the more controversial verses in Scriptures. Those who suppose themselves to be higher critics of the, the word will still point to this verse as one of the many supposed contradictions in the Bible, though there is no contradiction at all. As always, one must look to the broader context of Scripture. You can't always just base something on one verse. What's before it? What's after it? What's in the entirety of the book? What does the whole Testament say of itself? What does all of Scripture say to itself from cover to cover? Look to the broader context. So as always, one must look to that broader context of Scripture to properly frame a passage of Scripture. Now, Paul wrote this. This is where Paul's coming from with faith alone. Look at this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, speaking to his Jewish brethren, believing brethren. He says, We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. So this is what Paul is saying, and then we see what James says here. And so there appears to be this straightforward contradiction between these two passages. Again, James 2, 4, he's saying something different. He says, you see... That man is justified by works and not by faith alone. They're saying two different things. It can cause you consternation, but let's go to the text. Let's look at the whole picture. How do we reconcile these two things? Well, first is to recognize that they are both speaking of the same thing. They're speaking of justification, but they're speaking on different sides of it. They're speaking on different sides of justification. Paul is speaking to Jews who once thought that through the works of the law, that through obedience to the works of the law, they could be saved apart from faith. They thought their salvation, as many do, even falsely and erroneously in the name of Christ, that somehow that they can be saved by their good works. We heard that a lot last night as we were sharing the gospel. What are we supposed to do when we're so condemned by the law? Oh, we better choose the right. We better be good. We better do good. It's ridiculous. It's a preposterous notion. Okay, but James, 
He's on the other side of justification where someone has made a profession of faith. They, they've stated that their faith is in Jesus Christ, but there's no evidence. There's no fruit there at all. Okay? Uh, James is saying that it is good works, not works of the law, but good works, what Jesus called fruit. Okay? It's, it's these good works that shows, that gives evidence that a person is genuinely saved by faith, that they are truly born again and have been given a new heart. That's the evidence of it. We know that people can lie. People can deceive even themselves into believing that they are saved, but their works, it's their fruit or the lack thereof that tell the truth. James is here speaking against those that would abuse Jesus and Paul's beautiful doctrines of grace and justification by faith alone. We call them grace abusers. They're, they're false converts. Those who have fallen for an easy believism form of watered-down Christianity, and the country is full of them. This is very important in today's day and age where even the church has lost its solid grip on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe with good intentions, the road has been paved to hell for millions of those by those honestly wanting to see them go to heaven but have lost sight of that which actually saves, which is the finished work of Christ on the cross and his abiding presence in the life of the true Believer, that regeneration. Genuine faith and repentance, the biblical response to the gospel, have in many churches, even Protestant evangelical churches, been replaced with doing something. Okay? Raising a hand. Repeating a prayer after me. Making a profession of faith. Walking an aisle. Okay? Okay? getting baptized, or even joining the church. Some of these things, and many of these things, may be a part of a person's regeneration, but that's not the fruit that, that Jesus told us to look out for. Those are things that can be done and should be done. Some of them should be done in obedience, but we don't trust in those things. We trust in that cross and what Jesus did upon it, not what we did. We trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. All that James is doing in our passage is he's illustrating to us one of the many ways that give evidence to that possession of saving faith, genuine saving faith. So let's dive into our passage a little bit deeper. Let's back it up back to verse 14. All right, so we'll take a look at this. Verse 14, he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says? Look what's happening there. It's a profession. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, he has no fruit, he has no evidence? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister, this is a fellow Christian, is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, oh, go in peace. Be warmed and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Really, what good is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. So we can see the contrast that James is trying to expose here. There are those who speak sentimental, even caring words, but they don't actually do anything that reflects those words. Words should mean something, but words can be deceptive. Our tongues can deceive. This is why our passage, okay, that we're looking at today, chapter 2, has warnings on both sides of it about the evils of the tongue. Let's take a look at them really quick. They're on the same page that you're at. Look at first at James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his own tongue, he deceives his own heart. That man's religion is worthless. His works are worthless. Okay? 
Look at the next one, James chapter 3, verse 6 and 8. We get to tackle this maybe next week, Lord willing. Okay, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. And is set on fire by hell. And then verse 8, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Interesting to look at. There are a lot of people who will tell you that they are a Christian with no actual fruit to back up that claim. They say they have faith, but there's no fruit to back it up. The proof of whether someone is truly a Christian is when their words and their deeds match. Okay, there is a consistency there. There is an integrity. It's solid. There's an integrity to their lives. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed or word and deed, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Jesus showed us as well that there, there's to be action. There is to be faith and action in the lives of genuine believers. It seems as though we have been going to this passage a lot lately just as a reference. We haven't preached it as the main passage yet, but it's an important passage, and a lot of other passages point to this one. As everything in the Old Testament okay, pointed to the first coming of Christ, so everything in the New Testament points to the second coming of Christ, the day of the Lord, Judgment Day. So we've looked at this passage a lot. Look at Matthew chapter 25, okay, verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, the day of judgment. It says, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you invited, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's pretty safe to conclude as we look at this passage that James had this very teaching of Christ in mind when he wrote verse 15 and 16. Something to pay attention to in the Matthew teaching, though, is that both those who did and those who did not were not even aware of their action or their inaction. They, didn't even, they weren't even aware of it. We see it in their statements, Lord, when did we? Or their other statement, Lord, when did we not? Those who did to the least of these did so 
because it was a part of their new nature, their regenerate nature. It was because of the abiding presence of Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit within them. And those who did not do good to the least of these were just acting according to their old selfish nature, the nature of natural man. So it brings me to a, one of our points here. A genuine faith is an active not passive faith. A genuine faith is an active, not passive faith. Where does this become a problem in the church? Notice the passage says that the person in need is a brother or sister. That is, they are a fellow believer. That doesn't mean we don't look to the needs of those outside of the church, but particularly those inside. Let me ask you a real simple question. When a brother or sister shares a burden with you, sometimes we have these flowery words. What do we say to them? I'll pray for you. I heard somebody whisper it. I'll pray for you. Okay? So when you tell somebody that you're going to pray for them, do you actually do it? Or do you go on with your busy day and you forget, and the next day and the next day, and it goes on? Don't worry, I'm guilty of this. Or do you just say that you will pray for them because that's the nice thing to say. That's what a Christian is supposed to say. I want to kind of set a new standard in our church. I want to put a challenge before you guys. It's up to you guys to hold me to it and you hold each other accountable to one one another's. But I've shared this before. One of my professors, Dr. Carson, had a solution for this problem. It did not matter where you were or who was around. He was blind. He didn't know anyways. But if you ask Dr. Carson for prayer, or he said that he would pray for you, he did it right then and there, okay? And he he did it loud. You you learned quickly to be careful what you share with him and where you share it with him because uh, when he got done praying with you, God definitely knew what your problem was, and so did everybody else within earshot, okay? So you didn't go confessing some real embarrassing, shameful sin because everybody's going to know about it, you know? And then here's the next question I have for you. Does it ever occur to you that you could be God's agent to answer the very prayer that you lifted up? You could be the one that God is calling to meet that need and answer the prayer or at least a part of that need. We must live out our faith. If we say that people are dying and going to hell without the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think it's pretty imperative that if we believe that, we share the good news of the gospel. We let people know that. You know, we don't want our neighbors to go to hell. We don't want our friends. And truly, when you think about the penalty of it, if if you have enemies, if you're rightly thinking and you know you've been forgiven by God, you don't want your enemies to go to hell. You want to lovingly share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. James sums it up pretty plainly there in verse 17. He says, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. The test of whether a faith is genuine or if it is a, simply a professed faith is whether the faith actually does anything. Are there any works that would give evidence to a new heart and a new life of faith in Christ? Or are they just passive belief, simple intellectual assent? Okay, I I agree with that. Let's take a look at it, verse 18 through 20. Where am I? Not in the right book. Verse 18. But someone may well say, here we go, professions. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Yeah, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? James chapter 2, verse 18 through 20 there. James decides to play the devil's advocate. Okay, by, well, making a comparison with the demons, the devil's minions. Someone may well say, 
They're just saying it. Okay, this is a professed faith. Not certain, not, not sure if it's genuine. But if I said I put my faith in Jesus, I must have put my faith in Jesus. There doesn't have to be any proof. How dare you question me? This is becoming a huge problem today. Cultural Christianity is a cancer. It's spreading and it's rampant. I believe in Jesus, they say. I just don't go to church or read my Bible or pray or share the gospel or do anything at all different from the rest of the world, but I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. False converts. The Bible tells us that they exist, and there are many. James' response to that is simple. Show me your professed faith without any works. Don't tell me about it. Don't just say it. Show me. Give me evidence. Give me evidence. James says, don't hurt yourself there, Junior. I'll make it easy on you. I'm going to show you my faith by my works, by my deeds. My works will be the evidence that the faith is there. So a genuine faith in Jesus Christ in response to the gospel of faith is so much more than just an intellectual consent and an acknowledgement. It is more than that. A flippant, well, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus existed. That, that isn't enough. That's not enough. James goes on to say, that puts you in the same category as the demons. In fact, they know Jesus better than we ever will on this side of glory, but their faith was not and is not in Jesus. Let's take a look at this in the Gospels. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 23 through 24. It says, Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, a demon. And he cried out, saying, the demon that is, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? They're aware that God judges and that there's hell. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is the demon speaking. Okay, we see the same thing in Mark chapter 5, verse 7. And the demon says, he calls him Jesus, Son of the Most High God. That's pretty good theology from those demons. Of course they knew of Jesus. They know who he is. He's the one that kicked them out of heaven. Those few statements by those demons reveal a deeper theology than most of the church has today, but their trust is not and was not ever in him. They never submitted to him. They know Jesus. They know there is a God, and they shudder with fear at the final judgment in the lake of fire prepared specifically for their eternal torment. Look at that question back in Mark 1, verse 23 and 24. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? The only thing waiting for them is what? Destruction. Look what they say. Have you come to destroy us? Has, it, has the time now come that you're going to take us and cast us into the lake of fire? They knew what awaited them. But here's the thing. They have all sorts of right knowledge of who Christ is. They have no faith or trust or saving work in him. Your next point, passive belief. Passive belief does not save a soul like an active faith. Passive belief does not save a soul like an active faith. There's a big difference between believing in something and trusting in something, putting your faith in it. I absolutely believe that there is such a thing called a parachute. I believe it. I've seen quite a few skydivers in my life. I've seen parachutes in action. Do I trust them? No, I do not. Okay? I'm not going to put my faith in one and put it on and voluntarily jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Okay? Do I believe in parachutes? Yes, I do. Do I trust them? Nope. Now, if I saw flames coming from the engine compartment and could sense that the plane was beginning a rapid descent toward terra firma, 
that shoots on, baby. I'm putting on that thing. That's my salvation. I'm jumping. Okay, go down with the fiery flames of the plane or jump out. I'm jumping. In verse 20, James is challenging his hypothetical challenger to, to recognize that faith devoid of any evidence is dead faith. In fact, to think otherwise is foolish, and, and it shows that, that, that one is ignorance of Scripture. It's not just James. I don't know why James gets credit with the one saying that faith uh, works proofs faith. I don't know why he gets it, because Jesus said it too. Paul said it as well. They both point to it. Let's look what Jesus says, John thirteen thirty five. I go to this one a lot. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Okay, there's a love response. Love is one of the fruit of the Spirit. John 14 and 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Okay? The law of love, love others as yourself, the, the law of Christ. We looked at that in Galatians. And then verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If any loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Now think about it. If, if the living God is living within you, is truly there, and you are regenerate, and you have the Holy Spirit upon you, it's going to make a difference. There's the abiding presence of God the Father and, and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit. They're all there. And, and so the very next chapter talks about this. Look at J John chapter 15. Verse 1 through 6, this is called the parable of the vine. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned and they are burned so recognize something about the fruit we're talking about the works we're talking about not of us it's not a self-righteousness it's not self-motivated activity it's the presence of the living God working through us and abiding in us that's the fruit Paul the great champion of sola fide, okay, by salvation, by faith alone, through grace alone, all of those things, okay, the great champion, but he says there's fruit of it. He says you're saved by faith, absolutely saved by faith through the grace of God, but look what he says, Galatians 5, verse 22. Some of the Iwana kids knows this. But the fruit, the work of the Spirit living within you, the abiding presence of God is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. No law against those things. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, also Paul. Sorry, it's small. There's a lot there. It says, therefore, be imitators of God. That looks like something, doesn't it? Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. You know, we should imitate God the Father. Lori reminds me of this all the time when I'm driving with my daughters in the back seat. They're going to drive like you, you know. Yes, my dear. But walk as beloved children, imitators of God. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God is a fragrant aroma but immorality and or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks 
For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an, has an, who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. There's supposed to be a change. We're not supposed to be children of wrath. We're supposed to be children of God. Last week, we talked about how we often go to the epistles, okay, for practical instruction. It is this practical instruction that that represents the change that should be seen in the life of the genuine believer. It is accomplished by the abiding presence of Christ through God the Holy Spirit. Paul unapologetically preaches about salvation by faith alone, and there is no justification to be found in the works of the law. Because as we looked at last week, we have all been transgressors of the law. And for there to be salvation in the law, we must have kept the law perfectly. So don't go look into the law because you can't do it. And this is what he said in James chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, Paul didn't say this, James did. He said, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. It's that chandelier of righteousness. One link breaks, doesn't matter which one, the whole thing comes crashing down. So it's very important that Paul speaks emphatically, emphatically against salvation by works. And he preaches emphatically for salvation by faith alone, yet Paul believes that the regenerating work of God in the life of a genuine believer by faith will produce good fruit. It will produce good works, and there will be good, solid, permissible evidence that God has given them a new heart. One of Paul's most explicit Teachings on salvation by faith alone also talks about what? Guess the good works of God. Take a look at it. This is the verse. This is the go-to verse for salvation by faith alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? As a church and as individuals, we cannot always know the heart of our fellow man like God knows the heart of our fellow man. But, but we know that the tongue can be deceitful and profess a faith that is not really there, that is not really alive and is not really active and changing and saving. Sometimes the proof is in the pudding, okay? Is it in the, it's in the fruit born out of that faith. James states it clearly, you will know them by their fruit. Take a look at this, Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. This is the truth even of Old Testament saints, those before Christ. James is predominantly writing to Jewish believers. The Christian faith is relatively young at this point and is often the case. New believers can uh, kind of go to extremes in their understanding of certain beliefs. Many of the new Jewish believers understood They understood that they had been liberated from the the yoke of the law by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the finished work of Jesus Christ. Recognizing that they were not saved by the works of the law, however, they took it too far and they rejected any work whatsoever, even that work or fruit, that would give evidence of justification and regeneration, that evidence of new life. So James, for his Jewish audience, he appeals to the Old Testament, says, this isn't new, guys. This isn't new. The the great saints of the Old Testament proved out their faith through the things that they did. 
They proved out their faith through the things that he did. So he, he goes to some of these Old Testament heroes of the faith. Abraham, don't get any higher than that. And then Rahab, a woman of ill repute, you don't get any lower than that. And yet both saved by faith as evidenced through their works. Let's take a look at it. James chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God. He believed in God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So we have this seed of faith, okay? Uh, we, we share the gospel, and faith is born in the person in the process of sanctification, and new life begins. But here's the thing. In the life of any believer, we mature, and we grow, and, and the fullness, the perfection of that faith is there. A young man might be saved at a relatively young age. That faith is there, but he's still immature in the faith, and he doesn't know exactly what his calling is, and yet he grows up, and he matures, and he wrestles against the flesh, and he starts to win victories over the flesh, and then he grows up, and he starts to sense God's greater calling on his life, and the next thing you know, he finds himself enrolling in Bible college or seminary, and next thing you know, he finds himself volunteering to go abroad to Africa as a missionary, and all of a sudden, through what he he has done, the, the, the fullness of that faith has appeared, that fruit. It might have taken 30 years for that fruit to show up, but it's there. But there was fruit along the way. There was evidence that that faith seed was sprouting and starting to grow and starting to blossom and starting to mature. There's evidence there. So, we discussed in chapter 1 how God sent this trial upon Abraham for the purpose of proving his faith and for the purpose of strengthening his faith. Genesis 22, verse 1, this is what it's talking about. Now it came about after these things, we'll talk about that, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. This is a detestable thing that God has asked of Abraham. Abraham's like, what? But he proved faithful. He says, I trust God. God will provide the lamb. I fully trust in him. And, and he went through, and even his own son, Dad, uh, we're going for sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? God will provide the lamb, son. God will provide the lamb, son. But until then, you're the lamb. This is where his faith was tasted. He went all the way through until he drew up the dagger and the angel of the Lord said, stop. God now knows. God now knows you trust him, you believe him, your faith is in him. But here's the thing. Let's just go chronologically. In Gen this is Genesis 22 where the story takes place. Where, did, where was Abraham's faith born? Well, that's in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, verse 6, it says, Then he believed in the Lord, and he, God, reckoned it to him as righteousness. Faith first, and then the works, the deeds, the evidence, the fruit. Let's go on. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 24. Okay, I went too far. There we go. I, I must have missed that one. James chapter 2, verse 24. You will see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the spies, the messengers, and sent them out by another way. So in this story, they send in the spies of the land. Uh, they go into Jericho. They spy it out. Rahab hides them. Okay, they sense that the spies are in the land. They're looking for them. And at great peril, she risks her neck. She hides them. Her own king can kill her. You know, her own king's soldiers can come in and murder her, and yet she's at great peril hiding these men and letting them out safely in exchange for her own safety when the children of Israel came upon Jericho and leveled it. And we see the motivation. Why did she do it? Because she had faith in God. She had heard, 
And, and she professes here, and her actions prove she believes what she's saying. Take a look at this. This is Joshua chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. That's kind of small for some of y'all. But Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them, the spies on the roof, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has befallen us all. And that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, and whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. A solid profession of faith backed up by action. God's given you the land. There ain't nothing the king can do about it. I'm going to let you spies go. I'm not going to say, hey, they're in here. I'm going to let you spies go. When you return to take possession of the land that I believe wholeheartedly God has given you, please look to my safety. Look to my family's safety. And she was it. Just a couple pages before our main passage there in James chapter 2, two or three pages, we have Hebrews chapter 11. Why don't you turn there? This is called the roll call of what? The roll call of faith. Wim's looking at this, or did look at it, right? We are looking at it. So this is the roll call of faith. And everything is by faith, by faith, by faith, all the way through. We're not going to go through the whole thing. And yet, what comes after it? By faith what? What did they do? What did they do? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. And and what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. He did something. Okay? By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. Without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him for... He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about the things uh, not yet seen and reverence, prepared an ark. And, and so it goes all the way down. This, uh, I think, that, I think in, in another sermon, 27, 28 times it says by faith. By faith and what follows every single by faith, 27 or 28 times, what follows it? They did something. They did something. By faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told Nebuchadnezzar, we will not bow down and worship your filthy, disgusting, despicable idol. I added that part. It's pretty amazing to see faith. James ain't teaching nothing new here. He's not teaching nothing new here. He closes there in James chapter 2, verse 26, for just as the body... Without the spirit is dead. It's just a body. It's just there. It's dead. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's not saving anybody. It's not doing anything. Your final point is this. We know of the great heroes of the faith by their works. The evidence of their faith was what they did. What they did, even in our modern time, we talk about the great works of the missionaries. Okay? Adoniram Judson's of the world, the William Carey's of the world. Okay? They, they, they acted upon their faith. The William Wilberforce's of the world that did something. Okay? The Martin Luther's, the John Calvin's, the ones that stood up at great risk and peril facing the wrath of the Roman church. They did something. They stood up and they said something. And, they, and, and their actions revealed that there was truth and integrity to their words. Okay? This is why we covenant together as a church. This is why we agree and submit to one another as a church that we can be there and, and in love. Nobody. 
probably what I'm saying sounds radical to some because we're used to the watered-down consumer Christian. People don't like church membership or commitment or those things. We don't want to submit to anybody. Okay, we want our own sovereignty. Well, God is the only one that's truly sovereign. There are circumstances that have impacted your life that you had no control over. You know it. Don't deny it. There's going to be circumstances that impact your life that you can't control. Don't deny it. You know they're coming. Only God is sovereign. We're not sovereign. He is there. And he calls us unto the church to lovingly hold one another accountable. Now, that sounds frightening, and this can, uh, it sometimes can be uh, spill into legalism. Nobody, nobody detests legalism more than me. And I'll be the first one to call you out on it. We're all saved by grace. We're saved through faith. And yet, there should be victories. There should be works. There should be good fruit. And that's what we're called, to lovingly look for one another and encourage one another in those things. Go a couple pages. This isn't in my sermon. They're like, he's going long. He's off script. Hebrews. Chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession, our words of faith, and our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, Ecclesia, the church, Not assembling together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do love you and we praise you. Lord God, oh, oh, it's hard. It sounds hard, Lord. Our flesh is fearful. I was told I just have to place my faith and say that I believe in Jesus and all is well, and yet I'm hearing that i got to do something. No. No, that's not it. It's the abiding presence of you in our lives, Lord God. It's the evidence, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that shows us that our faith, our words are true. Lord God, it's not of ourselves. We, we can't do it, but you can. It's impossible for man, but nothing's impossible for God. Lord God, let us really contemplate and think about what kind of fruit we have, what kind of evidence we give. Lord God, let us think about our actions. Do our actions match our words? Is there integrity there? Lord God, let us hold fast to close Christian accountable and fellow, accountability and fellowships, Lord God, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who will lovingly tell us when, hey, your walk's not matching your talk, my friend. Your walk's not matching your talk. Lord God, we thank you for this great salvation of faith. And we thank you that you've given us new life because we were completely and utterly dead. We weren't on life support. We were dead in our sins and transgressions. But you have given us a new heart, a new life. Let it beat for you in everything that we say and do, Lord God. Lord God, I pray if there's anybody here who's made that profession, but they're honestly looking at themselves, they've properly uh, searched themselves and had introspection, and they say, you know, I'm lacking that fruit. I still have, I'm still a slave to sin. I still am not the person that Christ would be, and somebody who couldn't even convict me of being a Christian. Lord God, may it be your will that you call them this day to truly put on Christ Jesus. And live a life of faith and repentance. Lord God, fill them with the Holy Spirit. That there would be an abiding presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That will bear much fruit. Give them the works of God for them to walk in, Lord God. Lord God, we do love you and we praise you. Oh, what an amazing Savior we have. 
Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who perfected all things, particularly our salvation, through his obedience to your law, your decrees, and your commands, both in heart and intention and attitude and deed. Let us follow suit by your strength. Thank you for our church. Thank you that you brought us into fellowship to hold us accountable. We love you and we praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I want to encourage you. If you have questions about the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you need to talk about it, I'm willing.